morning. We're so glad you're here this morning out in this beautiful rainy day. Uh, we're excited of what God is doing. It's uh, just the worship together is amazing. And um, we're going to go farther now and just get into the Word of God and just see what God wants to speak to us through His Word. If you have a, a Bible, would you turn with me to 1 Corinthians 9? And uh, if you didn't get our email, we're going to be giving out our presents this week. So if you took a tag, um, we need that this week, probably before Friday or Thursday. So if you could bring those in, uh, just maybe connect with us so that we can get those. If you still have one of those left, because uh, they're going to go out to our families in need over at the school. So uh, we're excited to, to just partner with this, our school next door and... Uh, uh, help out some families. Uh, so yes, if you have those, please connect with us and get them here. And we've got a bunch so far. We're continuing our series in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, um, or 1 Corinthians, and we're going to be in this chapter 9 this morning. And um, we're just seeing how God has called us to be the church and what that means to be the church, what it means to live the gospel out in our everyday lives really what we're talking about, well, really what the, Paul wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to this church. And today we're going to be talking about being missional. And there's really a, a common mistake that churches can make from time to time. It's where pastors and churches just can be trapped by this misunderstanding and they may never even know it. Specifically that the, the church all they have to do is little more than just open up the doors of the church and people are just going to come in. Research has shown that's simply not true. That just doesn't happen. People actually are staying away from church in record numbers. And it's time to ask some questions. Why are churches not vital links to their communities? And what can we do to change that? What can we do to change the faltering outreach to our area, our communities, our city? In some cases, Americans are turned off by both the message and the messengers of the church. For many people, the church has appeared to be narcissistic and self-serving. Leaders often leave behind shattered lives in the wake of their you know, fallings and mistakes and compromised leadership. And the church's reputation was dramatically changed and eroded uh, and shaken the confidence because of scandals that have happened in the church. It says in, in, in 1975, the study was done, and it said 68% of the adult population expressed confidence in their religious leaders. So 1975, 68%. This year, that same study was done. It's down to 37% have faith and confidence in church leaders. And so we, as a church, we've got to consider some serious questions of relevance. In fact, there was a denomination at one point who surveyed a southern city where they were wanting to plant a church. And the survey centered around really one question that they had. And the question was, why don't you attend church. 74% of those surveyed indicated they felt like there was no value in attending church. 34% believed that the church had no relevance to the way that they lived their lives. And while the church doesn't, we're not here to accommodate some secular definitions of relevance, that's not really what we're here for. We do have to ask ourselves, why spend time answering questions that nobody's asking? And so there's a high cost to not understanding your generation, your culture, not doing the homework necessary to gain a fair hearing of the gospel in our culture today. And we must understand that it's, it's not possible, or that, excuse me, that it is possible to not be, or to be culturally relevant, and at the same time be sound doctrinally like we're following the word of God. And that's what we want to be. We want to reach our community, our city, 
in a way that they can hear it and understand it, but still go with the word of God. These two ideas are not mutually exclusive. It's been said that there's the only person that likes change is a baby with a wet diaper. And I'm not even sure that's true half the time, but that might be a little bit of an exaggeration. But for, you know, from my own observation, most people are hesitant toward any change in their lives. They don't like it. That might be the best change they've ever seen. They still don't, they're, they're slow to do it. Change takes us out of our comfort zone. It doesn't allow us to relax in what we know. It doesn't give us the assurance that we long for, that everything's just okay, everything's normal, everything's good. And it's like one deacon once said in a small Midwestern church. He said, change is sin, and we sin as little as possible around here. But when we try to resist any kind of change in our lives or even in the church, the only problem is is that we see change happening all around us all the time. I mean, you think about just what's happened in just the last hundred, maybe hundred plus years. If somebody was that old, you know, they would, the things that they would have seen change in their lifetime, they would have been seeing the things that came out during their lifetime, like Band-Aids and penicillin, Kellogg's cornflakes, Camel cigarettes, the World Series, Reader's Digest, Jazz, the Theory of Relativity, all these things happened. They remember not just when people landed on the moon, but when they first took, fl- they were just flying around, right? Those just over 100. Remember the terrifying toll of the worldwide influenza pandemic of 1918, let alone the one we're in the midst of now, right? And the heart-wrenching and hard times of the soup lines of the Great Depression. In fact, the way that we communicate in the last 100 years has changed so dramatically with emails and uh, text messages and video messages and all the things that we have today from what was 100 years ago. And we have to understand that this is the culture that we've been called to minister to. Right now, right where we're at, this is where we are called to minister to. This is our world, and God has placed us here for such a time as this, to share the good news of Jesus and what he has done, to bring that gospel message of Jesus Christ, that he came to this earth. Look, we're celebrating now Advent, right? We're in this Christmas Advent season. We're remembering that Jesus came to earth, God in human form. He came, he lived the life that we were meant to live, which was holy and perfect and following the Father, God the Father. And then... He died in our place for our sins on the cross so that we might have a relationship with God. And he rose again three days later, victory over death and sin and all those things. And he's ascended to heaven and he's left us the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. This is the gospel message. Simplified, but that's the gospel message. That's what gets us to know God by following Jesus and what he's done for us, accepting his work on our behalf, right? This is the message that we are to share with those around us, to the people of this generation. That's why we are here. And if we're going to do that, if we're going to share this message, if we're going to do it even effectively, We have to take Paul's example as our own example. And we need to present the message of Jesus in a culturally relevant fashion. And I believe that the church should be culturally relevant by while at the same time remaining doctrinally pure, following the word of God. And this is what Paul is talking to us and talking to the church at Corinth and to us today because we still have the Bible preserved for us in chapter 9. I want to just start reading. I'm going to read a little section of chapter 9 here. We're going to start in verse 19. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Corinthians 9, verse 19. We're going to read down through verse 27. He says, For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. 
To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside of the law. To the weak, I became the weak, or became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I might share with them in its blessings. Do you not know that in the race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others... I myself should be disqualified. And so during this series, going through the book of 1 Corinthians, we've seen Paul, again, under the, the inspiration and the direction of the Holy Spirit here, he's writing to this church in the city of Corinth because this is a messed up church. I mean, they are way off. And sometimes that can happen. Churches can get messed up. Paul calls this church babies, He tells them that they're doing some things wrong. And he tells them, you know what, church, it's time to grow up to be the church that you were meant to be in your city. And the church in Corinth, what they were doing is they were arguing over their preferences, their own comforts. They wanted their own, you know, detail. They wanted everything done. And a lot of the things that they were arguing about just was insignificant. And they were so focused on these things that they were not pointing people in the right direction of Jesus. Focused on themselves. They weren't focusing people to Jesus who could save them. And so they're talking about their freedoms. We have all these freedoms. And they said, we're free from our traditions. We're free from legalism. We're free from all these rules and regulations. We don't have to do these things. And Paul tells them, yes, you have been freed from these things, but you can either use your freedom as a license to sin, or you can use it as a license for mission. Instead of saying, I'm free to do whatever I want to, Paul says, I am free to connect with all people, to share the gospel with all people. I'm free to share the good news of Jesus with everybody. To tell them what Jesus has done for them, that God loves them and he wants to connect with them and he wants them to know him so that they can become who God created them to truly be. To be free of sin. Be one in Christ. And so he says, one here is a freedom that serves self. And the other is a freedom that serves other people. One is a freedom that's used to, as a license to sin, and the other is a freedom for a license for mission. And Paul wanted to win as many people as possible, as he says in this section we read. He wanted that more than he wanted to exercise his own rights. Go back to verse 22. I want to look at this again. He says, To the weak I become weak that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it for the sake of the gospel, that I might share with them in its blessings. And so really what this is, it's being missional. It's being missional to the people around us, everyone around us. It's taking the gospel to everybody that we can. This is what we're called to do as Christians, is to be missional. And we need to share the gospel with those people around us. And we need to do it in a way that they can understand the truth of what Jesus has done for them. And so we reach out and we share the gospel with those around us. Paul tells the church in Corinth here that there are four groups of people that he is taking the gospel to. And with each of these groups, he says he has to change a little bit in the way that he tells them the truth about what Jesus has done for them, the gospel. And he does this so that they can understand the truth of what Jesus has done. You go back to verse 20, and he says, To the Jews I became, a, I became as a Jew in order to win the Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, 
though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but rather the law of Christ, but under the law of Christ, excuse me, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became the weak, that I might win the weak. He says, I'm going to be a Jew to win the Jews. Paul was a Jew, right? He had grown up in uh, the culture of, Maybe, maybe not, but it's our job to bring the gospel message to those people around us. We're called to be missionaries right where we are, and this is going to look different for every single one of us, and the reason that that is is because every single one of us are different. We have different talents, different giftings, different, you know, the things that God has blessed us with in our lives, and God has blessed you with who you are to uniquely share the gospel with those around you. And so you don't have to fear, you don't have to have this pressure to share the gospel the way that maybe I do or the way Pastor Ray does or anybody else does, right? If your gifting is, is, is hospitality, share the gospel with hospitality. Get people around and have meals or whatever it is that you do and then tell them about Jesus, If your gifting is serving, do it with serving and tell people about Jesus. Use what God has uniquely gifted you to share the gospel message of Jesus. And we're going to get into this, these giftings of the Spirit here pretty soon, because Paul's going to get into this in the book, 1 Corinthians. So we're going to get into this pretty soon, but if you know what they are, use those things. The next thing is, is we've got to respect the process. So we're bringing the message of Jesus to those around us, that oftentimes when we do this, this can be a long process. Sometimes it's very quick, sometimes it's long. And we take this though one step at a time and we do it with love, doing our best to connect the gospel with those around us in a way that they can understand it. And we show the gospel also with our lives. We live it. We show how the gospel can relate to lives to our lives and other people's lives, and we bring hope and purpose to people. It's the way that we can connect God uh, with them, the God creator. And I want to tell you something here. Don't rush this process. Don't rush it, okay? Just let people, can, you know, just let, love people. Love the people around you and continue to let your life show the goodness of Jesus and the love of Jesus. Let the Holy Spirit work through you and lead you as you're around those people so that the gospel can take effect in their lives. And when you respect the process of this, it actually forces us to actually love the people around us to care for the people around us, to be a part of the lives of people around us. And then we have to be authentic. Sometimes as Christians, we act like we have it all together. Everything's good. We're always happy. We're always healthy. We're always wealthy. Everything's good because I follow Jesus, right? Nothing can go wrong. And then if you follow Jesus, guess what? Your life will be just like this. You'll be happy and wealthy and healthy. But we know that to not be true, right? That's not true. As Christians, though, a lot of times we can come off as inauthentic. And when we do that, it kills our relationship and and our testimony. We do this because we think that, you know, this will attract people to Jesus. Like everything is good if you come to Jesus. And we didn't come to Jesus because we had everything together. We didn't come to Jesus because we could do it by ourselves. We didn't come to Jesus because we were holy by ourselves. And so let's be authentic about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And people are going to notice it. They're going to see whether we're authentic or not in our lives. And again, this just means living for Jesus the way that God has created you. And so we love Jesus, we love God, and we, and, and we love the people around us. And we do this as we are submitting to God in our lives, and we do this as we follow and let the Word of God train us, and the Spirit of God lead us. And following Jesus is good. Don't get me wrong in this. Following Jesus is good. It does good things in our life, but it's also hard at times. 
And we need to live this authentic relationship out in front of those around us, the people around us. Be authentic, though, only works if you can do the last thing that's on our list here this morning, and that is be transformed. Let the gospel actually change you. See, the gospel had transformed the life of Paul. He was a different person because of it. He says in verse 16 there in chapter 9, Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. And then again in verse 23, he says, I do it all for the sake of the gospel. Paul was transformed by the message and the, of the gospel and what the gospel had done to him. It had given him a new life. It had given him a new identity. Has the gospel done that for you? Has the gospel changed you? We need to be transformed by the gospel and what Jesus has done for us. You see, the the gospel message of what Jesus has done for us is what saves us, and it's also what matures us in Christ. It's the message of Jesus, what it means for our lives. And we need to let that shine through in us. We need to be transformed by the gospel message and the word of God and the spirit that lives within us. That's the only way that we can be a light to those around us. And you see, Christianity will change the world only when every Christian will accept their role as followers of Jesus and that we are all called to be on mission. Can you imagine what God could do through us as Christians if every one of us lived this out? And the truth is, is that every one of us, I'm putting me in this too, every one of us are bad missionaries. Sorry to break it to you, but we are. And so we would talk about being on mission and missions. We, you know, we get this overwhelming feelings in our lives of guilt because we're not doing maybe what we should be doing when it comes to sharing the gospel with the people around us. Sometimes we can be lazy. We don't want to put the effort in. Uh, We can uh, think of ourselves more than we think of other people. We can miss the needs of others simply because we're just focused on our own thing. And what our, how we got to do in our own lives. And when we do that, we end up ceasing to be on mission. We don't become what God's called us to be as missionaries. And there was only one person who was good, who was on mission, a perfect missionary. There's one person who submitted themselves, who gave up his own rights and all his comforts and all of his privileges to pursue those that he loved. And he did this all the way to the point of death on the cross. And he did it for us. Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 through 8, and this is coming from the message translation here. He said he had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status no matter what. Not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave, became human. Having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life and then died a selfless, obedient death and the worst kind of death at that, a crucifixion. Jesus pursued us so that we could pursue him. He lived on mission so that we could live on mission. He sacrificed himself so that we could give of ourselves to the world around us. And when we really understand this, it'll bring us to the place where we become truly missional and we care so much about the lives of the people around us and we don't want them to miss what Jesus has done for them. We care for them. We show them the love of God and who He is. And so let me ask you this again. Have you been transformed by the gospel? Has the gospel truly changed you? Are you moving more and more closer to Jesus and what he is, who he is? That our lives actually represent Jesus and look like Jesus because the, wor- the spirit of God is working in us 
and we're studying and reading the word of God, the Bible, to, and, and applying it to our lives. Again, this is about spiritual maturity. This is what Paul's been talking to this church for a while now. We have to grow up. Are we being transformed by the gospel? Do we care and love those people around us? Are we free to live a life of missions and on mission to those around us? And this is what this is calling us to. Would you bow your heads this morning as our musicians come? I want us to pray with focus this morning. And the first thing that I want us to pray is just to ask the Spirit of God, are we, have we been truly transformed? Are we being changed by the gospel? This is a, a lifetime thing, but we need to be moving in this direction on a constant basis that the gospel is changing us, is softening our hearts, that we just truly love God and we love the people around us. Is that happening in our lives? And I want you to just ask God that question this morning. God, am I being transformed by you, by the message that you've done, by, that you've given us, Lord God? All that Jesus did for me, am I living that? Am I really in Christ and cha being changed towards you for what you have for me? And then will we just pray that God would give us a heart for missions? whether it's a global missions thing or whether it's a, especially a local missions thing for us right where we are right now. See, God loves you. And he loves those people around you, your family, your friends, your co-workers, your neighbors that live near you. God loves them and he's, he's calling them, but he's calling you to also be a part of their lives. So however you can, show them the love of Jesus. Let's pray for that heart this morning of missions. Not be overwhelmed by it, not to fear it, but by being who we are, just loving God and loving people, telling them about Jesus in the best way we can. And as our musicians sing, will you pray those prayers this morning? You're welcome to come on up to the altar and pray. Will you just take this time to allow the Spirit of God to lead us and speak to us? Let's pray.